Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for the gift of life. Thank you so much, Almighty God, for your faithfulness. We step into this service this morning and we trust you for what you are going to do. Father, I thank you, Almighty God, for veils that will be removed from our eyes. Thank you for your glory that will radiate upon your people. Thank you for the packaging of the Holy Spirit this morning that will brood and breed upon these words. That will cause these words to enter into the hearts of men and women, boys and girls. In every household where this will be heard. On everyone that will stumble upon this video or that you will lead to watch this video even on YouTube or on any other channel. I thank you that the coded message inherent in today's message, Lord, will be revealed to everyone for us to understand and see the power of what you have created us to become. Help us, almighty God, to tap into your agenda for this end time that will make ourselves available, that we will not shortchange ourselves. I pray for my brothers and I pray for my sisters all over the world that these words, Lord, we enter our hearts and challenge us and encourage us and help us so that we will align our steps back to your original intention at, uh, that you ordained in the Garden of Eden. Help us to realize what you have done at Calvary's Hill to bring back us back home. We thank you, Almighty God. Thank you for restoration. Thank you for redemption. Thank you, O Lord, that we have been accepted in the Beloved. Lord, we give you praise. In Jesus' name, we pray. Hallelujah. I bring you a message today that I've titled, Be, Do, Have, which is uh, a continuation of the series that I started last week. I spoke to you about this series called Wired for Success. And last week's message has been quite awesome. I've had a lot of testimonies from people who have told me it has been a blessing to them. So if, if you have not watched the part one, Wired for Success, please go back on YouTube and you are going to find the message there. Now, one of the, thing, one of the things, one of the ways, um, the place that we concluded last week was the fact that when God created Adam in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 to 28, the Bible makes us so that understand that God created man, and which is man and woman, in his own image, after his own likeness. And we understood from the book of John that man, that God is a spirit. And therefore, those who must worship God must worship him in spirit and in truth. All right, so we understand that. Therefore, the first thing that God created was a spiritual image of man and woman. And that spiritual image, God impacted some commands into that spiritual image. Not only that, God blessed that spiritual image. Last week, we concluded that in, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, when the Bible says, And God blessed them, saying, God blessed them first, saying, which means, imagine Adam, if it's possible, if you can imagine this, uh, even though it is not, that's not what it is, but if you can imagine when God created Adam and Eve in their spiritual image, if you can imagine that you could actually see um, a baby Adam or a baby Eve, as it were. Obviously, they didn't have a body. They didn't have a physical body, but they have a spiritual body. They have a body, nevertheless, a spiritual body that you cannot see with your physical eyes because God is a spirit, right? And after God created them, imagine a scene where you have a baby Adam here, you have baby Eve here, and they were having fun and enjoying themselves. And after God brought them into the world, in their spiritual nature, the first thing, the very first thing, the very first action that God performed on these newborn babies that he had brought into the world was to bless them. And the word blessed in that text in Genesis chapter 1 verse 28 was the word Barak. And Barak means to thank, to praise, to kneel down, to make, to, to adore. And that reminds me of another text that I shared during the midweek Bible service, which is in the book of Proverbs chapter 8, which actually speaks to 
the word god bless them saying god bless them that word bless god spoke over them is blessing the atmosphere that god created around humans the very first atmosphere they were exposed to was the atmosphere of the blessing was the atmosphere that speaks of adoration was the atmosphere that speaks of adulation was the atmosphere that speaks of praise and thanksgiving was the atmosphere of joy that was the atmosphere that they were exposed to and that's why i say all the time if you are not being joyful in your life you are out of course you are of course if you find yourself not being joyful or you are engaged in something that is not bringing joy to your heart then it's it's, it's a sign that you have gone off course in the book of proverbs chapter 8 the bible yes it was talking about wisdom but wisdom in this case is no other person than God, uh, than God, than Jesus Christ, actually. Now, it said here in verse 27. Now, actually, I start from verse 25. Actually, I start from verse 23. No, verse 22. The Bible here says, The Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way before his works of old. Genesis, uh, Proverbs chapter 8, verse 22. In the KJV, The Lord possessed me. In the beginning of his way, before his works of old, I was set off from everlasting from from the beginning, or ever the earth was before there was ever a, a place called earth. I was. And that's what Jesus Christ said in the book of John. He said, "Before Adam, before Abraham was, I was." All right. So essentially, before the earth and the mountains, everything was created. Jesus was, and he said, "Before the, uh, when there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no fountains abounding with water." Before the mountains were settled, before the hills was I brought forth. While as yet he had not made the earth, nor the fields, nor the highest part of the dust of the world. When he prepared the heavens, I was there. When he set a compass upon the face of the depth, when he established the clouds above, when he strengthened the fountains of the deep, when he gave to the sea his decree that the water should not pass his commandment, when he appointed the foundations of the earth, Verse 30, then I was by him as one brought up with him. I was by him, brought up with him, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him. You see here, Jesus Christ was with God the Father when before there was a thing called creation. And as creation was being created, Jesus Christ was what? Was beside the Father, and he was his delight. It was is the on a daily basis. I was daily is the light. Jesus was the delight of God the Father. Before God created all these things, and while He was creating all these things, which included you, He was His delight. And and rejoicing, you say rejoicing always before you see joy. Before creation was created, or as part of the substructum of the creation of the earth joy was inside and then he said verse 31 rejoicing in the habitable part of his earth and my delights my delights were with the sons of men Jesus Christ is saying not only was I the delight of the father not only not only was I rejoicing before him on a daily basis as he was creating all of these things not only did I rejoice in, in the habitable part, not the desolate part, in the habitable parts of this world where humans are living. But something more than that, my delights were with the sons of men. It says, Jesus Christ essentially saying, I delight in you. I delight in you. So when the Bible says, God bless them, say, be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth and subdue it and dominate and have dominion. When, when he gave that command, there was a precursor to that command. That precursor of that command was an atmosphere called the blessing. God blessed them. And that word blessed is synonymous. It's an environment that exudes joy. So now we see the environment that God expects for you to have, for you to partake of, for it, for it, for, 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 for it to be the predominant environment that you carry around yourself is the environment of the blessing. So the blessing, therefore, suggests that we are the blessed of the Lord. God blessed us, blessed us 
after he blessed us, he then began to give some commands. So now I say something here that when God created humans, God gave them dominion. God gave them dominion. And dominion means to rule over. Now let's look at what God said to humans. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. 26 to 27, the Bible says, Then God said, Let us make humankind in our image and after our likeness, so so they may rule over the fish, so they may rule over the fish of the sea, and the birds of the hair, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move on the earth. So we see here, God gave rulership of the earth to humans, not only. Did he give, give us rulership over the of, over the birds? I spoke about it last week. The things up in the air, the things on the earth, the things under the earth. God gave us rulership over these things. And God gave us rulership of over all of the earth. So when Adam was created, <laughs> the Bible didn't say that Adam was created a baby Adam. I give that example just to allow your imagination to see that there was an atmosphere when a child is born into the world. There is joy in the house. Everybody is joyful and happy because a newborn baby has been born into the house. Do you know that God, when God gave birth to Adam, as it were, or God made Adam and created him, God must have been joyful to have created Adam. The same way you as a father will be joyful or as a mother will be joyful when you give birth to a new child. That's when God was excited and happy when he gave birth to Adam. Uh, Adam and Eve when he created their spirit. So God delights in them. God delights in them. All right. I just want to hone in that. They have the God delighted in them. God gave Adam rulership. And how did Adam demonstrate the rulership? The Bible says in Genesis chapter 2, verse 19 to 20. Genesis chapter 2, verse 19 to 20. The Bible says, The Lord God formed from the fertile land all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky and brought them to the human to see what he would name them. To see what he would name them. To see what he would name them. Now, look at this. I'm reading the CEB version. The human gave each living being its name. Full stop. The human, this is Adam now. Gave each human being, gave each living being its name. The human named all the livestock. The human named all the birds in the sky. The human named all the wild animals. But a helper perfect for him was nowhere to be found. Now, I want you to say something wonderful here. Something worthy of note here. The Bible says the human gave each living being its name. If there's a thing that is a living being, God said it was Adam that gave them the name. And I look at this in the book of Genesis chapter 1. I went back and read it and I realized what God is essentially saying here is that God did not name any living thing. Apart from Adam, God did not name any living thing. All of the things that are like when I say living thing, living being, living being, not living thing, living being, a being, all right, not living thing, okay. A thing is a living thing could be a tree, a living thing could be, um, well, maybe it's animals, right? Thing, they are just a thing, right? But a living being, a being is a human being. The human give each living being its name. So here's what I saw God named Adam, Adam, right. Okay, God gave Adam his name called Adam. And God named all the other creatures. But God gave the name of other living being to Adam. The Bible here says, God brought them to the human to see what he would name them. The human gave name, gave each living being its name. The human gave each living being its name. The human gave each living being its name. What does that mean? It means Adam demonstrated such authority that he was able to name things that he wanted into his life by using his own mouth to command those things to come. Adam, as a matter of fact, was the one that named Eve Eve. God did not name Eve Eve. It was Adam that named Eve Eve. 
So we see the power that God placed on the human that he had made in his own image, that he had made us to be like him. The Bible says we are God-like. We have this God-like nature. And the God-like nature means that we are also creators. Now, if you step, take a step back and you begin to look at this, a number of verses, you realize that God already demonstrated this power of naming things into life by what he did. In Genesis chapter 1 verse 5, the Bible says, God named the light day and the darkness he named night. In Genesis chapter 1 verse 8, the Bible says God named the dome sky. In Genesis chapter 1 verse 10, the Bible says God named the dry land earth and he named the gathered sea, the gathered waters sea. So when we look at this, we see that God named things into being. God is a creator who creates things and name those things with name based on what he intended for them to be responsible for. I will say that again. God is a creator who creates things, who creates all things. And by virtue of him being the creator, he will name things that he has created so that those things can take on the nature of what he wanted them to be. Now, in the story of creation, there are three things, three categories of things that God created. Number one, God created the creation. The creation in this case will be the sea, the moon, the light, the sun, and so on and so forth. God created creation. Then God as creator created the creatures, so the birds, the animals, the fish, God created the creatures. And then lastly, God as creator created creators like himself, of, of, of which you are one of them. You are a creator just like God. How could you not be? How could you not be a creator if you were made in the image and likeness of God as creator? How do we know that God is the creator of all things? Because in Genesis chapter 1 verse 1, the Bible says, God, in the beginning, God created. The person who creates is a creator. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So God described himself in the book of beginning as the creator. And this God, who is the creator, (laughs) decided to create someone or something or some beings like himself and god said let us make man or humans like ourselves let us make them in our image and after our likeness let us give them dominion over the earth so that they can dominate this earth that we have created so god by his own decision allowed humans to be the epitome of his creation and he gave us authority over everything that he had created so now we see a pattern of how god creates it when god created the creation remember i said three things three categories of things that god created the creation the creature and the and the creators i'll say that again the creation the creatures and the creators. Those are the three categories of things that God created in the book of Genesis chapter 1. When God created the creation, let's look at the pattern that he followed. In Genesis chapter 1 verse 9, the Bible said, God said, let the waters under the sky come together into one place so that the dry land can appear. And that is what happened. I'm reading the CEB version again. Uh, and verse 10 says, God named the dry land earth and he named the gathered water sea and God saw how good it was. Here, I call out a couple of things. What pattern of creation did God follow to create the creation? Number one, God had a desire which is in his mind. God wanted to create the earth. God wanted to create the seas. God wanted to bring land out in this situation. God had a desire of what he wanted. That desire of what he wanted is in his imagination. God then did what? God spoke out his desire out of his mouth. God said, let the waters, which is what I have decided to do, which is what I have imagined to do, come together into one place. God said, bring them out. God spoke his desires out. Number two and number three, 
God assessed what he has done, what he had created, and he declared them to be good. Number four, when God said, let them come together into one place, God put into motion the law of separation. The law of separation says that everything is separated unto its purpose, which means everything that is in the world has a purpose. You, as a human being, you have a purpose. Because by the law of creation, you are not a, hap- you are not a product of happenstance, neither are you a failure. God brought you here for a reason and a purpose. There's nothing in this world that has no purpose. Listen, there was a time I was watching documentary with my children, and we found that a plant, is it, I think it is a plant, yes, a plant that, that, come, that shows up in one day, I think it was a plant or, or, or a plant, I think it's a plant, it's a plant or an insect that shows up in one day and within 24 hours had to die. The entire lifespan of this, of this insect or, that, or, or the plant is for 24 hours. But that plant, it, 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 that, that plant was necessary as a continuation of life for another animal. Everything that God created, it may not make sense to you, but everything that God created, the Bible declares them to be good, including yourself. So if somebody has told you and say you are a nobody, you are not good enough, you are not beautiful enough, you are not wonderful enough, I want you to know that is a lie. Because the Bible says in the book of Genesis chapter 1, I, I believe in verse 31, at the end of the book of Genesis chapter 1, you know what the Bible says? When I read it, this is what it says. It says here, I'm going to read it for you, my Bible here says, and God saw everything, including you that he had made and behold he said look pay attention it was very good it was very good and it, and the evening and the morning were the sixth day everything that god created god says what well, they were very good the word good there is the word that means prosperity everything that god created was very prosperous because that's what he intended to to to, to achieve i hope you're following the conversation now let me let me let's take it step back go back to that story in verse 9 to 10 verse 9 to 10 we see therefore yeah that god separated things into its purpose and then god gave them a name yeah, that determines their destiny or that reminds them of their purpose. There are five steps that God called out in the creation. He had a desire which is based on his imagination. He spoke his desires out. He, he put things into their, into their purpose by separating them into their purpose. He then named them, based, giving them a name that reminds them of their purpose, right? And then he looked at them and said and declared that they are very good. If you look into your life, if you look into your life, God had a desire as well to create you into this world. God spoke out and said, let us make mine our own image. That's what God said. And then what did God, what did God do? God says, you are very good. God bless you. God assigned you a purpose. What was the purpose? Be fruitful, multiply, replenish the herd, subdue it and have dominion that is your own purpose that is my purpose my purpose is to do what is to be fruitful is to multiply is to replenish the earth is to subdue it and is to have dominion that is the purpose and god then said this one this one i call adam this one i call human this one i call the one who is the head of all my creation and this one i have called the head of all my creation i put in charge of the entire earth that i have created this is the way that god created now let's look at how god created the creatures in creating the creatures god brought every creature out of the creation that he had already created and he declared them to be good which means that is another principle we got here. Another principle we got here is every creature must come out of a creation. Every creature must come out of a creation. Human beings as creatures came out of God who is a creator. The source of every creature is its creation. So when you take the fish, which is the creature of the sea, out of the sea, which is its source, the fish will die. If you take animal out of the ground and they do not, they, they cannot, they do not feed on the ground, which is their source, they eventually will die. Verse 20, Genesis 1 verse 20 says, let the waters swarm with living things and let the birds fly above the earth up in the dome of the sky. 
God created the great sea animals and all the tiny living things that swam in the waters, each according to its kind, and all the winged birds, each according to its kind. God saw how good it was. Then God blessed them. God said, Be fertile and multiply and feed the waters in the seas and let the birds multiply on the earth so the creation the 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 the, the story of creation of the creature followed this pattern again god had a desire which is in his imagination god spoke his desires out but god directed the source to which his desire relates to to the source to which those things are going to come from god had a desire which is in his imagination god spoke his desire out but god spoke to the source to produce the creature god spoke to the sea to produce the fish god spoke to the head to spoke to the head to produce the birds do you see what i'm saying god spoke to the source from which these things will come for the production to come all right that's number three and then god looked at what he had created and god said they are beautiful God assessed them as good and God pronounced blessing upon them. But now, notice one thing that God did not do. God blessed them with multiplication. God said they should multiply in their environment in which he has placed them. But God did not name them. What does that mean? Let me explain to you carefully. You see, when you are in a source, when God took you out of the source where you are, in the source from which you came, that's where your multiplication is. I will say that again. When you take a thing out of its source, out of the foundation of its creation, that thing ceases to multiply. I will say that again. When you take something away from its source, away from the source from which it was made that thing ceases to multiply rather that thing begins to die if you take the fish out of water the fish cannot multiply on the ground the fish are to multiply in the sea if you take fish out of the of the water and put the fish on the ground that fish in a million years will not multiply you have to take that fish back and put that fish in the sea for that fish to multiply to become a school of fish if you take humans made in the image and likeness of god out of god we, we, we cease to multiply we cease to succeed the way god wants us to succeed the pattern of creation is is being taught to us today so that we can understand how god created so now in creating the creators in creating the creators let's look at what god said god said let us make man in our image i'm reading the cb version god said let us let's make humanity in our image to resemble us why so that they may take charge why so that they may take charge why so that they may take charge of the fish of the sea the birds in the sky the livestock all the earth and all the crawling things on the earth god created humanity in god's own image now look at the next sentence in the divine image god created them say with me i am of the divine say with me i am of the divine hallelujah say with me divinity is alive on the inside of me say with me divinity is alive on the inside of me you know in some churches they have some people that they call them saints this and saint that and saint that and saint that and would they give them some sort of uh, divinity um, status but truth be told every human being on the face of the earth is of the divine this is the reason why every human being who recognizes that he or she has been made in the image and likeness of God cannot settle for less in this life. God made us in his own image. God created us. The Bible here says male and female, God created them. Then God blessed them and said to them, be fertile and multiply, fill the earth, master it, take charge of the fish of the sea, the birds in the sky and everything crawling on the ground so what we see from here is because we're made in the, in the image and likeness of god for one reason so we can take charge over the earth so the god likeness of humans 
mandates us to take charge over our environment. And now, how do you take charge over your environment? One of the ways we saw from how God took charge of the environment is by speaking. You must learn to speak over your environment. You must learn to command over your environment. You must learn to declare what you want for your environment to be. So, the, uh, the first assignment that Adam had, apart from the assignment of him tilling the garden and shooting the garden and walking in the garden, the assignment, the other assignment he had was to name things. God, the Bible said God gave, brought all the animals to him for him to name them. The human gave each living being its name. Now, I got a question for you. What are you allowing to be named into your life? What are you allowing to be named into your life? What exactly have you allowed to name into your life? What have you named into your life? What are you naming into your life? What have you allowed to be spoken over you? This is the reason why what you say carry a lot of power. If you say negative things, you reap negative things. Why is that? Because divinity is on the inside of you. You are a child of God. You are meant to do. You are meant to be to do to have. To have dominion over this earth. The human gave each living being its name. You are the human. What have you named over your wife? What have you named over your children? What have you named over people around you? What have you named over your business? What have you named over your environment? What have you named over your country? Because God, the Bible here says, the human named all livestock, all birds in the sky and all the wild animals. The Bible here says, God brought these things to human to see what he would name them. It was a test in, it was a test in authority. It was a test in authority. And man, Adam did not fail. Praise God. Adam did not fail. God said, Adam, what are you going to name this one? Show me that you have seen, you have seen how I name things and you are ready to follow suit. And Adam, therefore, remembering how God named things, began to name them, began to call things by their name. Do you imagine, do you understand the level of authority and, and the, the, way, the way of thinking that Adam must have, must have had when he was naming these things? There was no sense of lack, inadequacy, I, I'm not good enough, I, I'm not qualified. There was no such sense in Adam. When, when he was naming these animals, he named them the name that he wanted them to be. And that is what they became. God did not even challenge them. The Bible said, whatsoever name that Adam named these things, such name is what God allowed for them to be named. Praise God forevermore. So what name are you going to name over your life? The power is in your mouth. You got to name it. Now, some who have thought that human beings have lost this dominion, the ability to name things into their, into their lives because of the fall of Adam. I want to show you something. In the book of Psalm 8, verse 5 to 8. Now, remember the book of Psalm was written before the new covenant came. This was written before Jesus Christ showed up in the world and redeemed the, the, the whole human race. Look at what the Bible says. The Bible says, when I see and consider your heavens and the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have established, what is man? that you are mindful of him and the son of earth born man that you care for him yet you have made him a little lower than god you have made him a little lower than god and you have crowned him with glory and honor you made him to have dominion over the works of your hands you have put all things under his feet now look notice god made you a little lower than himself but not only that god crowned you with glory and honor so i want to talk to you about this glory and honor for a few minutes before I step into the message of be do have. The glory is from the Greek word, it's from the Hebrew word kabode. So kabode has to do with abundance, riches, reference, splendor, and dignity. What this means is that there is an inherent dignity in every human being on the face of the earth. This is the reason why humans are not designed to be treated as slaves. The glory that God has placed upon humans forbids such act. The word honor, on the, other, on the other hand, is a very rich word. This word means royalty. It means that which magnificently adorns like an ornament. There's a scripture that I found in, um, in the book of 1 Peter, when the Bible says that um, the Lord encompasses about us. The word that was used was was segula, and segula means um, when we when we say we are his royal priesthood, right? Where is royal priesthood? The word actually that was used was segula. It was it means uh, the king.
king's treasured jewel. The king's treasured jewel. So when the Bible talks about here that honor means that which magnificently adorns like an ornament, God essentially says, Bible says God, have, God has crowned you with glory, right? With riches and splendor and abundance and splendor and honor. That which magnificently adorns like an ornament, which means you are the ornament that God wears. You are the ornament that God wears. I got to ask you a question. Do you think, do you think God will wear an ornament that is unworthy, that is stupid or is or, or whatever name that you may have been called that you have chosen to believe? Do you think God will wear such an ornament? I kid you not. When God created you, he adorned you with his own glory and with his own honor. God is proud to wear you. God is proud to live on the inside of you. God is proud for him to be carried about by your body. That is how precious you are. That's the reason why you should not look down on yourself and say, I'm a nobody. I have no worth. That is a statement from the pit of hell. If you only know the way God sees you, I'm going to show you in a moment. If you only know God, the way God sees you, you will know beyond a shadow of doubt that God has hardwired into your being what I call royalty, what I call success, what I call the DNA of success. The word, the word, the word honor is a rich word that means that which magnificently adorns like an ornament is a word used to describe a thing of splendor. A thing of beauty, a thing of comeliness, a thing of majesty is a word that depicts royalty. Have you ever woken up in the morning and look at yourself in the mirror and say, I am royalty? I am royalty. Have you ever looked at yourself in the mirror and say, I'm royalty? Do you ever look at yourself as an ornament? Let me ask you a question. If you have an ornament today, Let's say you bought it for 10,000 pounds or 100,000 pounds or you have a gem, let's say a million dollars or two million dollars. Where do you keep that gem? Do you put it in your backyard in the way you put your garbage? You don't do that, do you? No, you put that ornament in a box. You, some of you might even go and take it to the bank to go and keep it in the bank so that it doesn't get robbed. Do you know that you are of more, you have, you have more worth to God as a treasure than that than the, that the, than the costless diamond or ornament in this world. If God could open your eyes to see the way he sees you, what he has crowned you with, what he has put on you, what he has depicted you to become, you will not for one day allow anybody to speak down on you and make you to feel like you are a nobody, that you cannot become anything. Every appellation that you have believed, every word that you have believed, that somebody has spoken over you, is a word that you learned to believe because you have not embraced or understood what God has asked actually declared over your life if if you have ever believed yourself to be stupid if you have ever believed yourself to be ignoramus if you ever believe yourself to be not smart enough not good enough not beautiful enough not handsome enough not powerful enough not strong enough it's because you have compared you have chosen to listen to the language of the devil the language of the world system and you have used them to set up the standard of comparison for yourself you have looked at yourself based on your physical realities and you have said i am a nobody the bible says god crowned you with glory and honor you are somebody who has been endued with the blessing the beauty the glory the grace and the glory of god when you look at these words the rich many of this word kabode and the word that means honor is a word that means you have been crowned with abundance of reality people of god i want to say to you beyond any shadow of doubt if anybody has ever confused you and told you that you are a nobody this morning i bring a word of assurance from the lord i bring a word that will tear the veil apart and let you know that you are more than that that you are more than that that you were made in the image and likeness of god last week i asked you a question i said has god failed
failed. If God has never failed and you are made in the image and likeness of him that has never failed, how could you in a million years think of yourself as a failure? You are not a failure. You may have made a mistake, but that doesn't make you a failure. You are you have you may have made a mistake, you may have gone off course, but you are not a mistake. I kid you not, people of God. Let me tell you something that is quite profound today. If you are on the face of the earth today, you are here for a reason. You already want the battle to show up here. Do you know how many spam cells ought to have come before you showed up? But you won the victory. Do you, do you know how many battles you have fought along the way that you won, that you are still here? It means that there's something about your life. You have earned the right to be here. You have earned the right to be here. I am speaking to somebody today. The enemy has tried to beleaguer your mind with thoughts of unworthiness. We thought that you can't do it, that it is not possible. I bring you a word from the Lord that that thinking is thinking, thinking. You need to get rid of that thinking and put it in the bin and throw it away. You need to embrace a new thinking now that says, I am royalty. You have the abundance of royalty upon your life, head. God expects every human being whether they are born again or not born again, God expects every human being to carry a sense of majesty, a sense of splendor. You are literally surrounded with an atmosphere that reeks of majestic splendor. If you could see your true self in the realm of the spirit, let me show you what God showed me. God showed me three things, three things that humans have by virtue of the fact that they were created in the image of God. Three things. Number one, there is a crown on your head. Number two, there is a royal robe on your backs. Number three, there is a scepter in your hand. Three things that every human has. Whether now you believe it, whether now you embrace it, whether now you appreciate it, it's a separate conversation. I hope you understand that. But there are three things. Three things that you have. Crown on your head. Royal robe on your backs. Staff in your hand. The crown on your head speaks of your royal status. God expects you to think like royalty. The crown is crowning your head. God expects you to think like royalty. Think, think like somebody who owns the earth. Let your thinking be shaped by the thinking of royalty. You have a crown on your head. The thinking of a king. The king is a king over a kingdom. A kingdom is a domain of the king. The domain where God has placed you, God has placed you as king in that domain. So think like one. The robe on your back. The robe on your back is a robe that says... You are royalty. The robe that covers shame. There's no shame in your life. When you sit down as a king, you are meant to be set apart by, by your appearance, by the demeanor that surrounds you. What about stuff in your deceptor? That's authority. When you speak, you speak like one who has authority. This is the atmosphere that Christ himself carried when he was here. That's when, when, he's, when he preaches, the Pharisees will say, this one speaks like one who has authority because he, know, he knew who he was. There's nothing about you that depicts the mundane. There's nothing about you that depicts the mundane. Hallelujah. Now, I want to share with you, because I know I'm out of time. I want to share with you the be do have principle, which I think I'm going to deep dive next week. This be do have is after God has spoken to human and God has blessed them. You know, God said, be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. That's what God said. That's what God said. Now, I want you to look at something here. God said, be fruitful, which means produce more, produce more, more of what? What I have kept on the inside of you. I would I'll go into detail next week. What I've kept on the inside of you. And they say, multiply. What are you multiplying? Multiply what you have. So do multiply. Do replenish the earth. Do subdue it. What about dominion? Have dominion. So we came up with 
be do have principle the be do have principle is a principle of success that god had wired when he ushered that command upon every human being god said you can be should be fruitful you should do multiply you should do replenish you should do subdue you should have dominion that's what god wants you to do so what this therefore means is the being precedes the doing and the doing precedes the having in order for you to have or to manifest in the physical what god has already asked asked you to have like to have dominion you have to start from the being you have to be first before you can do you have to do before you can have you have to be before you do you have to do before you have so to be fruitful means To bring more of fruitfulness into your life. But you cannot be fruitful unless you are seedful. I'll go into that next week. You need to know that the seed that will produce the fruit is already on the inside of you. And then do multiply. You take what you have, what you have produced the fruit of, you begin to multiply to have more of it. Then you replenish, you feel everywhere. Then you subdue, you stamp out anything that want to work against you, or you you subdue, you bring everything under the control that God has called you to. Then you have dominion. So, as a child of God, fortunately for us, we already have the be in our spirit, which is the image and the likeness and the God likeness of God. You know, we said last week that God has made us like in His own image. So you already have the God likeness image of God in you. You already have the seed of God in you. Remember, there's a principle that says every seed produced after is kind. So when God said be fruitful, it means it, it means what? It means you already are seed full. You are full of the seed that will produce the fruit. But we need to know how to take what the seed. To plant it so that the seed can produce after its kind. So, next week, I'm going to continue this be, do, have principle of success. You don't want to miss it. I'm going to go through how you can be fruitful, how you can multiply, how you can replenish, how you can subdue the earth. That's what I'm going to be covering next week. So, before we go, if you are here and you believe that your life has not been fruitful, you haven't had the kind of success that you thought you should have. I want to show you something based on what we looked at before. We looked at that when God, that God created three categories of things. The creation, the creatures, and the creators. And we saw that in every one of this creativity process, God started with something first. God had a desire. He had a desire for something. Right now, where you are. I want you to close your eyes if you can. I want you to close your eyes if you can. So think about what you desire right now with your eyes closed. Imagine it. A light to bubble forth. Can you see it in colors? Is it very clear to you? That which you desire. Just like God created. Remember God had a desire. And he, he imagined what he desired first. God didn't just randomly create. create. He imagined what he desired. So what have you desired? Imagine it. See it in pictures. Let it be very clear to you. As you ponder it, imagine the way he makes your heart to fill up. Imagine he makes it, the way he makes your heart to fill up. Yes. The more your heart gets filled up with the image of what you want to become, the more real it is to you. The more your heart sees it and believes it. All right. Now, the Bible says out of the abundance of the heart, what will happen? The mouth will speak. Now, begin to speak it out of your mouth. Begin to speak it in positive present tense. So, for example, if you want to be a doctor, begin to say, I'm a world-class doctor. I'm a world-class doctor. And as you say that, remember you are holding to the picture of what you have seen. I'm a world-class doctor. I'm a world-class doctor. Or I'm a world-class lawyer. I'm a successful businessman. I'm a wonderful child of God. I have my own family. I'm a wonderful wife. Or I'm a wonderful husband. I'm a wonderful father. Begin to say what you see in your heart. See it. Declare it as a present reality. Please, you need to see that picture. And you need to see that picture like it is already real. Amen. Now, the Bible says the third thought in that God, God acted at what he had desired and which he had spoken at. God did not act until he had desired, which is which is he had imagined, and then he had spoken out. 
God did not act until he had done those two things. So you don't begin to act until you have imagined and until you have spoken out. So now, as you stay there, as you begin to make that affirmation and declaration in the positive tense, and you're holding on to that picture of what you want to become, I want to say something quickly. As you say those things, be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. What is telling you is going to give you an inspiration of what next you need to do. When you finish this um, message, go back and act it out. Begin to act positively, positively in the direction of what has been ministered to you by God. Now, with assurance that what which you have seen in your mind's eye has already happened. And then, in due season, you will receive what you have desired. Amen. This is how God created. And this is how you can create. You want to be? You want to do? You want to have more? You want to be more, do more, have more? It starts with what you allow your imagination to stay focused on. Your imagination must be focused on and filled with the picture of who God has called you. Your speech must be filled with what God has called you. And your actions must be like what God has called you to act upon. Praise God forevermore. Now as we leave here, I want to pray for you. Father, I pray for your children. As they leave here, Lord, help them to understand what we have done here. Let this message be what they go back home and practice over and over. Practice the imagination, the speaking, and the acting out. Because this is the way you expect us to create our own success. Lord, we thank you now. We give you praise. In Jesus' name, we pray. Now, if you are here, you've not given Jesus Christ, you've given your life to Jesus. You have not given Jesus Christ a chance to be Lord over your life. I'm calling you now to pay attention and yield your life to Jesus. All you have to do is believe in your heart that he died for you. He died for you to take away anything that will make you not to be like God wants you to be. He took that away and he gave you a new life. All you have to do is receive it. Are you ready to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior? Say with me, dear Lord Jesus, thank you for dying in my stead. I receive you now as my Lord and Savior. Thank you for having me. In Jesus' name, we pray. Now, when you say that, out of your mind, you believe that in your heart, the Bible says you are now a child of God. Please write to the church. We have a small book called The Call to Sonship. It's a book that will bless you. Write to the church. We'll send you an e-book of it and then you can begin to read about who God has already declared you to be because he has made you in the image and likeness of Jesus. Until next time, remember, you're blessed and highly favored.